Hello everyone. Here we are about to launch into the second week of History 308. This is where we start digging into the origins of the modern world. So strap yourselves in for some big historical questions about the foundations of globalization. For the next two weeks, we'll begin dealing with a period of time that historians have labeled the early modern era, roughly spanning the three centuries between 15, 1450 and 1750. Your textbook uses the phrase connecting the globe, and for good reason, because it was in this time that the eastern and western hemispheres of the planet began to be integrated economically, politically, and culturally into something that we can call the modern world system. Understanding how and why that happened is the major goal of these first two weeks. We're focusing this coming week on the birth of the Atlantic world, which is the subjects of chapters 15 and 17 of your textbook. This video is meant to give you uh, an overview of what the term Atlantic world means and its significance for world history. I'll also elaborate on the assignments due throughout the week, including the conversations on the discussion board, the quiz on this week's material, and the first homework assignment due at the end of the week. So make sure to watch the entire video for details about these assignments after the main overview. So what do we mean by the Atlantic world? Well, you're probably accustomed to thinking of world history in terms of land masses, continents separated by oceans, and these continents divided into human societies and political institutions like villages, countries, empires, etc. Take this map of the world, for example, from 1450. You'll see in the Eastern Hemisphere, in Asia and Europe, uh, huge societies, some uh, bound together by empires, other smaller decentralized uh, political organizations um, that aren't welded together in imperialism. And this is a typical way to look at this with a focus on the land and the people living on the land. Um, but consider the Indian Ocean uh, right here uh, as the focal point. Instead of focusing on the continents, focus on the ocean. And as you saw in the video that I made for last week, the Indian Ocean by 1450 was um, connected, had been connected for hundreds of years through trade, through overseas trade that was also linked to uh, overland trade. So when you think about this, think about the Indian, instead of thinking about the continents and the empires that surround the ocean, think about the ocean as the center of focus and consider this to be an Indian Ocean world where the the links between different cultures and different societies are bound through over long distances by trade, by overseas trade and overland trade. Um, and that trade, as we saw, was primarily in luxury goods over long distances. Uh, this is when Asia was the real focus of the global economy, if there was such a thing. Uh, and this Asia-centered world economy, if you want to call it that, had been taking shape since the rise of Islam in the 7th century. And Muslim powers, the Islamic Caliphate, could guarantee safe passage between the two worlds, between the Mediterranean on the one hand, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Indian Ocean, long separated since the decline of the Roman Empire. Now, as later generations extended Islamic conquest from Spain all the way to Somalia and Africa, uh, West Africa and Java, the networks of Hindu and other traders were welded to those of the East, the West, and the Near East. Com commercial enterprises boomed. At the edges of all the empires and all the uh, polities here, merchants dealt with a still larger world. So traders brought, bought Chinese porcelain and silk into Canton and Malaysia. Europeans shipped Indonesian spices through the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Seas. And from Eastern Europe, Turkey and Sub-Saharan Africa came other crucial imports like gold, uh, principally used for coining money, iron, timber, and slaves, both black and white. Uh, this we can call the Indian Ocean world, and we're going to return to the Indian Ocean next week. But for now, keep in mind that until 1500 or thereabouts, if there was something that we can call a world economy or the beginnings of globalization, it was centered on Asia and on the Indian Ocean. It's probably more accurate to describe this as a hemispheric system of trade. Now, with this in mind, 
What is happening in the Atlantic Ocean before 1500? From the perspective of world history and globalization, not much. As we saw in last week's video, the Atlantic Ocean was not, like the Indian Ocean, a zone of trade connecting the continents and societies that bordered it, but instead a barrier. This is the true significance of the year 1492, which kicked off the process of integrating the peoples and economies of the surrounding land masses into something that we call the Atlantic world. Between 1492 and 1750, this ocean-centered world became increasingly and rapidly integrated into a system, a system that would also be linked to the Indian Ocean ultimately, thus marking the birth of a truly global economy. And here, I want to emphasize the economics, that is, the role of trade in the Atlantic world. It's critical to understand that this system was driven by the growth of imperialism, specifically European imperialism. By, 15, by 1750, there had developed a sophisticated and highly integrated system of triangular trade in the Atlantic world. And you can see this mapped out on here to some uh, limited degree, where the each part of the Atlantic world, each continent, Africa, Europe, North and South America, are divided into a distribution of labor in terms of the trade system uh, being driven by European imperialism, where the colonies created by Europe in North and South America produce raw materials, raw cro cash crops like rice and tobacco, like uh, indigo and, and hides, which are exported to Europe predominantly to England once the system is in place. Uh, and meanwhile, England creates the manufactured goods that are then sent back to the Americas and sold to Africa, where they're used to buy slaves. The slaves are brought across the Atlantic into the colonies and used to produce the, those cash crops. And so it's a triangular system. Uh, and it's really important to recognize this, uh, that the economic centrality here um, but also to realize that the birth of the Atlantic world is going to come to transform all of the cultures and societies that are integrated into it uh, and then ultimately uh, give shape to the processes of globalization that we'll be studying throughout the semester. So the big questions to investigate this week when we're dealing with the birth of the Atlantic world, and this is up to you to do the reading and to and ask these questions. The big ones are how and why did all this happen? So what is driving the birth of the Atlantic world, which will uh, uh, be uh, in place, solidly in place by 1750. And then specifically, uh, how were the cultures and societies, in what particular ways were the cultures and societies of the Atlantic world all transformed by this process of the development of uh, the triangular trade system? Now, with all that being said, uh, let me just uh, give you an example of uh, a little, an illustration of the world significance of what happened in 1492 and the birth of the Atlantic world. Recall that contact between the peoples of the two halves of the world had stopped some 15,000 years ago, and I've been arguing that 1492, when they came back into contact, would be one of the most significant moments in world history. Well, now I'm going to make that argument directly and in an excruciating detail. So here's a thesis. 1492 was the most important moment in world history because the encounter between the peoples of the eastern and western hemispheres began a string of changes that transform every aspect of life all around the planet. Now on to the evidence I'll present to back this argument up. First, the concept of the Columbian Exchange. What is it? Well, this term was coined in 1972 by Alfred W. Crosby, a historian at U of Texas in Austin. Here's the basic definition of the Columbian Exchange that he came up with. The Columbian Exchange is the widespread exchange of animals, plants, human populations, communicable diseases, culture, and ideas between the American and Afro-Eurasian hemispheres following the voyage of Christopher Columbus in 1492. Now, before 1492, the two hemispheres were distinct and separate ecosystems. 
which had developed one of the, on their own for perhaps as long as 15,000 years. Exchange caused unprecedented alterations in both of those systems. Let's start by talking about animals. From the old world, that is Europe and, and Eurasia, moving from there to the new world, where were animals like cats, chickens, cows, donkeys, ferrets, goats, honeybees, the horse, rabbits, pigs, rats, sheep, silkworms, water buffalo, and guinea fowl. None of these animals existed in the Western Hemisphere in the Americas before they were brought over by Europeans. Going the other way in terms of animals from the Western Hemisphere to Europe, we have the alpaca, the American mink, the guinea pig, the llama, the muscovy duck, and the turkey. Okay, so this is the transfer of animals from one hemisphere to the other. Let's look at plants now. From the New World, that is from the Americas going over to Europe for the first time, are agave, avocado, common beans, bell peppers, blueberries, cashews, chili peppers, cranberries, cocoa, long staple cotton, maize, manioc, papaya, peanuts, pineapple, potatoes, pumpkin, rubber, squash, sunflower, sweet potato, tobacco, tomatoes, vanilla, wild rice, zucchini, and much more. None of these things existed in Europe before they were discovered in the Americas. And crucial to this are maize, that is what we call corn today, squash, and common beans. Being brought over from the old world to the Americas, almonds, apples, artichokes, asparagus, bananas, barley, beets, black pepper, cantaloupe, carrots, coffee, citrus, cucumber, garlic, grapes, hemp, nutmeg, olives, onions, peas, radishes, rice, rye, soybeans, tea, turnips, wheat, and more. None of these things existed in the Americas before Europeans brought them over. So it's a huge exchange of plants and animals. Now although more animals and plants moved from the Europe to the Americas, the Columbian Exchange was an extremely unbalanced process that favored European peoples and that facilitated European imperialism. How so? Well, first, from the beginning, beginning in the 16th century, Europe saw a net growth in its population. That is, we begin to see a population boom over time. Now, how do we account for this population boom beginning in the 16th century? We can't credit hygiene or medicine. None of these things have advanced uh, very much in the 16th century. Europeans were well known for their backward medicine and filthy hygiene. The real factor here was an immense expansion in the food supply provided through the new sources uh, discovered in the Western Hemisphere. After 1492, Europe's diet improved, in part through the cultivation, new cultivation techniques, but mostly from the adoption of new food crops first cultivated in the Americas. Native Americans had developed domesticated hybrids that were more productive than Old World counterparts. So measured as an average yield in calories per 2.5 acres, Vegetables like cassava, maize, and potatoes all trump traditional European crops like wheat and barley and oats in terms of the amount of nutrition you can get uh, uh, from the amount that you grow. The food supply expansion meant population expansion. So in Europe, maize and potatoes gave farmers larger yields on smaller plots, which benefits poor farmers in particular. It took at least five acres, plant it, in grain to support a family, but potatoes could subsist three families on the same amount of land. New crops were more flexible, able to grow in more soils than wheat. In effect, maize and potatoes extended the amount of cultivatable land in Europe. The two spread quickly, becoming fundamental to the peasant diets in Italy and southern France by 1700. Now, potato cultivation was a little bit slower and spread primarily after 1680 in northern, central, and eastern Europe often as government policy to alleviate famine. This happened in Ireland during the 18th century when the potato, when the Irish population expanded from 3 million in 1750 to 5.25 million in 1800. This was so critical was the potato, which had never existed in Europe before it was brought over from the Americas. Uh, a tropical plant, cassava, could not be cultivated in Europe, but it thrived in Africa, where it was introduced by the Portuguese traders along with maize during the 16th century. The introduction of cassava helped uh, facilitate a population surge in Africa as well. 
And in terms of our story of the Atlantic world uh, trade, that population increase actually became supply for the slave trade in the Atlantic world to replace Indians dying in droves in the uh, Western Hemisphere. Meanwhile, as I just indicated, back in the Americas, the European invasion affected an ecological revolution, an abrupt play with the inter uh, uh, break with the interplay between humans and nature that had previously characterized the world before. Never before in history anywhere in the world had so much of the world's flora and fauna been so thoroughly and rapidly mixed. Now, Indians have been altering nature all along. Uh, especially in densely urban areas like Central America, the Andes and the Mississippi Valley. But the Columbian Exchange put greater such demands on American nature and transformed uh, it so irrevocably that it triggered a whole cascade of processes that alienated the land from the indigenous peoples. Um, that included things like all new kinds of weeds and included things like European rats and of course um, it included diseases. So in the Western Hemisphere, what we see is a population decline, a population decimation, a population disaster. Uh, this whole process has been to, of, of the invasion of plants and animals and microbes has been termed ecological imperialism. So in some native peoples and their nature experience an invasion, not just of foreign people, but also of their livestock, vermin, crops, and weeds. Uh, these all work together to transform the environment, altering nature previously known and made by the native people. So think about this. When you go camping in a remote area, sometimes you imagine that you've rediscovered a timeless wilderness that is like the one Native Americans lived in before 1492. In fact, everywhere in the United States we see altered nature, profoundly affected by all the plants and animals that tagged along with the colonists to remake the continent. Now, who were the most savage and deadly of all the European colonizers? Was it the Spanish? Was it the Portuguese? No, it was microbes. Everywhere they went, the first European explorers and colonists reported horrifying and unprecedented epidemics among the native peoples. Spanish soldiers first exposed the indigenous peoples to diseases they had no experience with, and therefore no natural immunities or medicines to combat. These spread rapidly and immediately into epidemics. Everywhere Europeans went, and then even proceeded, and then began to precede even their arrival. So diseases would move ahead of Europeans, decimate populations before Europeans even got there. These diseases included things like measles, scarlet fever, typhoid, typhus, influenza, whooping cough, tuberculosis, cholera, diphtheria, chickenpox, and a whole range of sexually transmitted diseases, none of which the native populations had any experience or immunity to. So note up front, the Columbian Exchange was lopsided. As usual, the old world, uh, the old world uh, got very few of the uh, negatives all of the benefits and the new world uh, received mostly negatives and very few benefits. The most notable of the diseases was the destructive smallpox lethal to nearly all Native Americans uh, and especially an especially hideous disease the incubation period of smallpox is about 12 days it moves really fast once inhaled the virus invades the mouth and throat it migrates into the lymph nodes and begins multiplying by the 12th day of contracting it it's in your bloodstream and a second wave of multiplication occurs in the spleen bone marrow and lymph nodes symptoms and in initial initial stages include muscle pain malaise headache and prostration also nausea vomiting and backache after 12 days Days, visible lesions, small reddish spots begin appearing on mucous membranes of the mouth, tongue, palate, and throat. The lesions enlarge and erupt, releasing large amounts of the virus into the saliva. 24 to 48 hours after that, those lesions, rashes appear on the forehead, spread rapidly over the whole face through the torso and all extremities, followed by a whole new wave of lesions. An Indian in the 16th century Mexico described what he was watching saying, quote, they could not move, they could not stir, they could not change position, they could not lie on one side nor face down nor on their backs, and if they stirred, much did they cry out. Great was its destruction. Covered, mantled with pustules, very many people died of them. 
I also want you to think about the tragedy of culture here. Indians approach these epidemics religiously, much like Europeans approached the Black Plague uh, earlier in the centuries, as a consequence of spirits and sorcery, not as a natural phenomenon. The appropriate response was shamanistic rituals. Further, many Indian groups, especially the Aztecs, interpreted these waves of death as signs of the gods' disfavor, or worse, as manifestations of the invaders' supernatural powers. This contributed to a fatalism that weakened Indian resistance. Some estimate that the fatality rate in the native Amerindian population to be as high as 80 to 90 percent. In fact, our understanding of the power of smallpox combined with recent archaeology has led many to dramatically revise the population figures upwards. Numbers are still speculative, but early in the 20th century, numbers were that about 10 million died in total. Um, we're now thinking that this might be up to 50 million. So whatever the estimates you accept, this was probably the most devastating population collapse in world history. As Alfred Crosby, who wrote the Columbian Exchange, wrote, surely the greatest tragedy in the history of the human species. All of this helps clarify our former characterization of the continent as virgin land, virtually untouched by humans and longing for European settlement. In the 19th century, the historian George uh, Bancroft wrote of an unproductive waste its only inhabitants a few scattered tribes or feeble barbarians in sum the Colombian exchange of microbes and plants was a disaster for Native Americans but it was a double boon for Europeans first Europeans obtained expanded supply which permitted unprecedented reproduction of their populations second they acquired access to fertile and extensive new lands largely emptied out of native peoples through the exportation of diseases. In effect, the Colombian exchange depleted peoples on the American side of the Atlantic while swelling populations on the European and African shores. And eventually, that surplus population flowed westward to refill the demographic vacuum created on the American side of a newly developing Atlantic world. Okay, so with all that um, as the overview, <clears throat> let's just go through a little bit on the assignments that are due this week. Make sure you're all up to date on what's expected, and uh, I'll give you some like tips and advice on how to go about all the material for the week that'll help you out with each module that we do. So there's four basic things, uh, commands I want you to think about uh, over the course of the week. To read, to discuss, to take the quiz, and to write. Uh, now there's a lot of material to go through and what's really important about these online classes is that you try to get a jump on things. Uh, there are deadlines for all of these different assignments but waiting until the last second to try to do the, uh, meet these deadlines is going to you're going to have a big problem, especially with it being an eight-week class, and there's so much material to go through. I hope that I, these are all, these assignments are all designed to kind of build on each other, and each one to help inform the other one. So let's go through these one by one. First of all, you know, you got to do a lot of reading for this class, and um, some weeks are going to be heavier than others. For this week, for example, there's two chapters to read from the textbook, chapters 15 and 17. Recognize that we're skipping 16. We're going to do that next week. Uh, every week there's going to be two chapters, so you got to get used to that. And in order to answer the quiz questions, you have to give yourself a lot of time to go through these textbook textbook chapters. You're not going to be able to find the answers to the quiz just by flipping it over and looking for them. Uh, looking for it as we'll uh, see in a minute. There's also additional readings. So there's a short article by historians um, <clears throat> Kenneth Pomerantz and Stephen Topic called The Economics of Violence. And this is important to read because one of the quiz questions is based on this reading and then I would like you to incorporate this uh, into the discussions and into the, uh, the homework for this week. Uh, there are primary source documents. There's three of them for this week that are listed there. As you'll see from the way the assignments are built out, you don't necessarily need to read every line of all of these. What these are are first-hand accounts from the period in time that we're looking at. That is, they're primary sources. So with all that said, you have these two big chapters, an article, primary source documents. I want to give you some guidance on how to do this. So if you check in the module one overview for the week, you'll find a study guide. What's in that study guide is the specific quiz questions that you're going to be uh, looking to answer. Uh, and you'll see that they're pretty 
detailed questions uh, that you have to use to guide your reading of the textbook and the, uh, the other readings. Uh, and also the homework prompt for that week. So you can look at that right away and you can see what you need to questions that you need to be answering. This class is full of questions. You'll see what you need to answer and use that to guide your studying. So look through the questions before you start reading the textbook and the other readings in order to know what it is you're actually reading for. So keep the quiz questions in mind and the, uh, the study guide in mind as you do the reading. Now the discussion board uh, is designed to help you to, first of all, it's a requirement of the class, and it's designed to also help you to kind of work through the material for the week. So there will be a major question that's, that, that's already posted to the discussion board that you're going to need to respond to by Wednesday at the very latest. Now, I don't recommend that you wait until Wednesday because you're going to be graded on the discussion board depending on how much you interact with other students, you follow up on other questions, uh, and you build on the, the discussion on the board. But you'll be expected to at least respond to that big first question by Wednesday at the very latest. But reply to fellow students also. I'd like this to turn into a discussion. You can also use your first response as a jumping off point to ask, get asked questions about the quiz, to walk through the quiz questions, um, <clears throat> and use it as participation. This is participation in the class. Uh, so there'll be a major question post it right at the beginning that you'll need to have your first response to by Wednesday at the latest or you lose the points for that discussion board uh, for that portion uh, but then also you know start get getting into get into it in advance the earlier you post the more frequently you post and I'm looking for substantive posts based on the readings not your own opinions and it's just don't make stuff up uh, the more points you'll get for the discussion board portion of the of the of the grade the there I'm going to post a follow-up question by Wednesday so you're going to respond to that first question by Wednesday at the latest I'm going to, on Wednesday I'll post a follow-up question that you'll need to respond to by Friday at the latest and that question is going to ask you to build on all the material that you read for that week so this is the discussion board um, the quiz as I said is based on the um, study guide all the questions you see are in there so you can open up the study guide. I recommend that's the first thing you do after watching this video is open up the study guide and see exactly what you're going to be asked to uh, answer on the quiz and focus your reading on answering those quiz questions. Recognize that these answers in this quiz require paragraph length responses. Okay, so there, there I, I believe there's eight questions. So every week there'll be seven to eight questions. The questions are not multiple choice. There's no multiple choice questions here. So every question requires you to type out a paragraph length response um, and a paragraph is a, a sub the questions are big so the paragraphs require some substance to them and to indicate basically that you did the reading that you went into the textbook and found the answers to these questions uh, but you're gonna have to develop the answer it's not going to be all in one place in the in the textbook so um, Looking at the study questions ahead of time is not only recommended, it's essential for getting yourself ready for that quiz, which is due every week by Thursday. So that's the quiz. Uh, the last thing you'll do for the week is write, and that is a homework assignment, which is due on Sunday of the week. This uh, homework assignment is really focused on the primary source documents that are posted in the under readings. Uh, these are first-hand accounts from the period. And I'm going to be asking you to do some analysis of them. Um, so focus your analysis on the primary source documents. In the study guide for the week, you'll see the prompt for the for the homework assignment. So look at the prompt and think about it as you're doing all the reading for the week. Um, draw on all other material for the class for historical background and historical context. So you're analyzing a specific primary source, but the more you know about when it was written, who wrote it, what was going on when it was written, the more informative your homework assignment is going to be. And begin to cite all the sources in your homework. So when you're quoting from one of the documents, cite that source. If you're quoting from the textbook or some other reading, cite that source. Uh, and that'll be due by Sunday. So all of these elements build on each other. Um, you're going to see the discussion board question posted right now so you can begin to answer it as you start doing the reading uh, and you'll see the um, the quiz questions in the study guide and the prompt for the study guide 
uh, in the study guide also for the homework. So take a look at all that stuff. And please, if you have any questions about any of this, let me know. You can post questions to the discussion board for the week. You can post them to the Q&A section of the discussion board. You can email direct me directly if it's a more personal kind of question or if you want some detailed advice for just yourself. But the more you discuss it with other students, the material, uh, the, the better it'll be for the whole entire class. So good luck.